Welcome to Nerd Heaven. I'm Adam David Collings, the author of Jewel of the Stars, and I am a nerd. This is episode 98 of the podcast. Today we're talking about the Star Trek Continues episode, The White Iris. The description on IMDb reads, Captain Kirk finds himself haunted by guilt from his past as the fate of an alien world hangs in the balance. The teleplay was written by James Kerwin, Chris White and Vic Mignana, based on a story by Vic Mignana and Chris White. The episode first aired on the 29th of May 2015. This episode was dedicated to the memory of Leonard Nimoy, placing it in time just after he passed away, which was certainly a significant and sad moment for all Star Trek fans. Going into this one, I didn't remember the episode. Looking at the thumbnail and description on the Star Trek Continues website didn't ring any bells, but I knew I must have seen it before, because I've watched all of Star Trek Continues. It gets right into the action from the get-go. Some aliens, the Kelsons, are expressing their pleasure at the invitation to join the Federation, when Kirk is unexpectedly attacked from behind by one of them. He's beamed to sickbay, but is suffering fatal damage to the part of the brain responsible for emotional memories. Spock suggests an experimental drug. It hasn't even been tested yet. They don't know the dosage. Now, I have a feeling that in the real world, by administering this drug to a patient, McCoy would be doing something highly unethical and probably illegal. Although Kirk does give his verbal consent. Still, giving an untested drug that doesn't have approval to a patient has got to be a huge risk. Kirk sees a vision of Raina, an android woman Kirk had feelings for in the episode Requiem for Methuselah one that I don't remember in huge detail either. Spock erased all memory of Rayner from Kirk's mind to spare him the pain of her death. But now he remembers it all again. After just a few seconds of receiving the medication, Kirk is himself again. And then he's straight off the bed and back to duty. I get that there's a time critical situation on the planet, but minutes ago he was near death. Now he looks okay, but he's been given a guest dosage of an experimental drug. Who knows what kind of side effects he might experience. I think it's kind of insane not to keep him in sickbay for observation for a while. Spock is an accomplished commander and a capable diplomat, and he can always liaise with Kirk from sickbay. This was a big believability problem for me. Anyway, McCoy, Scotty and Uhura marvel at how nothing could keep Kirk down. Now, I talked back in the first episode about how the music was put together for this show. Vic Mignana took recordings from the original series, cut them up and made them work for the new scenes. But for this episode, they did things a little differently. This episode had a brand new original soundtrack composed by Andy Farber. Vic had wanted original music played by a real orchestra. But finding someone who could write in the style and flavour of the original series was hard. That's not how shows are scored these days. Faber discovered Star Trek Continues before they'd actually released any full-length episodes, and knew right away he'd love to write some music for the show. He sent some samples to Vic, and the rest is history. The original music was performed by the Eastman Studio Orchestra. In fact, one of the performers was the cousin of Fred Steiner, who was one of the composers for TOS. They even did their own re-recording of the classic Star Trek theme. The results are quite amazing and really lifts the show into new territory. It was definitely fitting to have original music for such an emotional character piece. Kirk has a lot of guilt over Raina. In his opinion, while she started off as an android, she was human when he pushed her too far and she malfunctioned, unable to deal with the conflicting emotions inside of her. I'm not sure that human is the right word here, but Kirk clearly saw her as a sapient being. So Kalsus, the planet they're currently orbiting, wants to join the Federation, but their sister world opposes it and will do anything, including assassinating Kirk, to prevent it. 
although I do wonder how they think Kirk's murder will accomplish what they want. The Federation is giving them a defence grid to protect their world, but Kirk is suddenly hesitant, possibly because he's seeing another vision. This time a woman named Nakia. She appears to be a new character created for Star Trek Continues. Interestingly, she is named after the actress that plays her, Nakia Baris. Nakia is ghostly transparent. Kirk can't remember the passcode for the defence grid. He created the code himself, with the understanding he would make the final decision whether or not to give the grid to the Kelsons. Nobody else knows it. See, this is why you use a password management product like KeePass. Kirk leaves Spock in charge while he reports to SickBay for further tests. Spock hopes that Chekhov might be able to decrypt Kirk's forgotten password. It wouldn't be a very secure system if that were possible. But Chekhov mentions that at the Academy he once decrypted something of Zindi origin. This is really cool as it's reference to the Zindi who nearly destroyed Earth in Enterprise Season 3. A story that took place chronologically long before TOS, but was of course produced long after TOS. I do appreciate these touches. On the way to sickbay, Kirk sees a little girl in the hallways. Who is she? So the sister planet fires a missile at Calsus. They're not mucking about. The representative is desperate for that defence network now. Why hasn't Kirk told anyone about his hallucinations? This is an annoying trope in Star Trek. A character is undergoing something super weird, but they keep it to themselves. <laughs> it's pretty annoying. McCoy senses there's something Kirk isn't telling him, but Kirk is a little non-committal as to what it is. There's something wrong with Kirk's heart. It's weakening and McCoy has no medical explanation. Spock asks Chekhov if he's tried a brute force attack to guess the password. Chekhov points out that the computer on this device is designed to shut down on repeated failed login attempts. Well, that's something. Honestly, if a brute force attack could work, then Starfleet needs to fire their entire IT department. And Spock is pretty silly for suggesting it. Kirk finally opens up about Nakia. They served together on the Farragut 13 years ago. They were very close, but she died in the line of duty and Kirk blamed himself. He's never spoken of her. He thought he could forget her. I quite like that they created a new character from Kirk's past to go alongside the older ones that we've seen in the show previously. It means we're not just dwelling on nostalgia, as cool as that is, but we're also pushing things forward with new backstory. That's what sets this kind of writing apart from a lot of fanfiction. Technically, of course, this show is fanfiction, but it's of a very high quality. I'm really curious what a psycho tricorder detects. There is a strong link between the biological and the mental, of course, when it comes to health. There are physiological things that affect the mind, the emotions. But a standard medical tricorder should show you all you need to know about the physiological. And how can a device like a tricorder tell you about the non-physiological aspects of mental health? It would have to be a telepathic device. Perhaps it's not so different from a standard medical tricorder. It's just configured to focus on aspects of the brain and body that are specifically related to mental health. In any case, Kirk's emotions are being affected. He's cranky. He's giving in to emotional outbursts that he'd normally control. He's ignoring very reasonable recommendations from McCoy and Spock, and honestly, being a little paranoid. The actress playing Edith Keeler is very well cast. She does a fantastic job of replicating Joan Collins' way of speaking. A replacement console is days away. Sulu emphasises to Uhura to inform Spock as well as Kirk, which already shows how he's starting to lose the confidence of his crew. Also, interesting to note that Smith is back, this time the Prime Universe version. So she's probably been on the Enterprise this whole time since where no man has gone before, which I think is cool. The Enterprise is unable to destroy the incoming missile because it seems to have disappeared. We're never really given an explanation for this. I assume the sister planet has some form of cloaking technology on their weapons. 
we get a little more insight into the cultures of these sister planets. The people of Chalcis developed a spiritual culture, while the others became more materialistic, and disdainful of the Chalcis way. Now this is an example of the Planet of Hats problem, which Star Trek does so often, where an entire planet's population will share a specific personality trait. And this concept has been rightly criticised by many. But on the other hand, I think there's room for a little of it. If we look at the countries of Earth, we see there are some commonly shared traits. For example, the British people are often thought of as stiff, while we Australians have a reputation for being laid back. You could say that Americans are generally quite materialistic as a people, but some European cultures might be focused more on family. It's all generalisations and stereotypes, which of course will break down. But that doesn't mean there can't be some truth to these kinds of perceptions. So I'm willing to let the episode get away with this. Spock is meeting with McCoy and McKenna to discuss Kirk's state of mind. The physical injury is healed. His problems might be related to the experimental drug, but there's no evidence of this. McKenna can't assess his mental state without Kirk's cooperation. This might be one of the big differences between physical and mental health. While patient consent is certainly a big issue in medicine, you don't need much input from a patient to set a broken leg. But you can't help a patient with mental health difficulties unless they're willing to be a part of it. And Kirk is certainly not willing. He dismisses McKenna to discuss the issue at hand with his officers. The next hallucination Kirk sees is Maramini, Kirk's late wife from the planet Amerind, where Kirk spent some extended time having lost his memory. That episode had a number of issues, but it also dared to do some darker character stuff you wouldn't typically see in the 60s. For that, and its introduction of the mysterious preservers, I quite like the Paradise Syndrome. Its biggest flaw, of course, is that it has zero consequences. We never hear of Miramini or her child again. It's as if Kirk is just over it. But that's more of a flaw of the series, and 60s television mentality in general, than it is a flaw of this particular episode. Anyway, that's where Star Trek Continues comes in. The little girl shows up again. I wonder if Kirk is starting to put it together yet. McCoy is surprised to note that Spock is considering that what Kirk is seeing may be more than just hallucinations. Vulcans believe in the Katra. McCoy uses an argument I've often heard. I thought Vulcans were a people of science, implying that being a person of science precludes a belief in anything spiritual. Spock counters this by saying, to be a people of science is to acknowledge that sometimes science points to something more. Vulcans are also a people of spirit. Those two are not as contradictory as people assume. I think it can be argued whether this statement is consistent with Spock's character as established in TOS, but I really like its inclusion. Star Trek usually comes from such a strictly naturalistic point of view, that it's nice when it does acknowledge the possibility of something more. Smith reports a drag on the Enterprise's flight path. I like the moment when both she and Sulu put it together at the same time and share a knowing look. This drag could be caused by the missile, and this might be their clue to locating it. Kirk is so distracted by the ghosts of his former lovers that he can't give the order to fire. Spock very wisely gives the order himself. Technically, this is a breach of the chain of command, but Kirk is clearly not himself. This was the right call. When Kirk gives an outburst in front of everyone addressing his hallucinations, he finally realises how compromised he has become. He should have known it a lot sooner, but that was probably another symptom of his condition. He relieves himself and hands the ship over to Spock. I mean he relieves himself of command, of course, not the other kind of relieving oneself. The camera pans to Spock and holds there for a few seconds. He has a satisfied look on his face. 
But it's not because he has ambition. It's not because he wants Kirk's job. It's because his friend has finally seen the light and done what's best for him and others. McCoy reminds me, on purpose I'm sure, of Dr. Boyce when he brings Kirk a dose of brandy. But he needs a distraction to scan him. His heart is working at 15% efficiency. Another arrest is inevitable. When Kirk doesn't respond to McCoy as a doctor, he tries to engage him as McCoy the friend. But Kirk doesn't believe he's not alone. He's reminded of the women he has lost. Duty first. He asks McCoy if he thinks Kirk loved those women. McCoy answers, I think you've loved a lot of women, Jim. Kirk does have a reputation as a ladies' man, but that's not what Kirk is asking. Yes, he's had a lot of lovers in the past, but did he actually love them? Kirk answers yes, he did love them, and he can't let them go. Bones assumed Kirk was just a playboy who wanted a string of one-night stands. But deep down, Kirk wants more than that. He always has. But command leaves no room for those kinds of indulgences. At least at this point in Star Trek history. By the 24th century, we'll see captains marry and have families raising them on starships. But this is not that kind of Starfleet. Not yet. This is where things get really interesting. Spock enters as Kirk is seeing all three women. He mind melds and sees them. He asks them what they want. So what does this mean? Does it suggest they are more than just hallucinations? Can a Vulcan see another's delusions through a mind meld? I'm honestly not sure. Delusions and hallucinations happen in the brain, in the mind, and it is the minds that are connected. Spock says they need resolution, closure, of a type only Kirk can offer. So he's viewing them as something more substantial. Kirk is heading down to the planet with the console, against McCoy's recommendation. But is this different from before? He's relieved himself of duty, so Spock is currently in command. But maybe Kirk still needs to play a part in all of this. If he can get better, maybe he can remember the password. Except that's not where he goes, so maybe I misunderstood. When he first enters McKenna's quarters, there's a little moment that kind of mirrors one in the first episode, where McKenna walked in on Kirk shirtless. McKenna is hardly naked, but she does seem taken aback, and covers her shoulder. I think the show might be suggesting there's some mutual attraction between these two, possibly because the actors were together in real life. But for memory, that doesn't go anywhere. Kirk doesn't know why he's here, but he's looking for answers. McKenna thinks this isn't about resolution, it's about guilt. Kirk is the one who needs the resolution. He needs to explain to them why he failed them, which he never had the chance to do before they died. These hallucinations give Kirk a unique opportunity that few of us ever get. Enter the pseudo-holodeck. I'd forgotten that the show revisited this. He meets the women from his past, in the place where he last met them. And he better hurry because there's 23 new tricobalt warheads headed for the planet. Edith wants to know why Kirk held McCoy back from saving her. Why did he deliberately let her die? She forgives him. She understands. I think it's possible the real Edith Keeler may have understood as well. She dreamed of the world he was saving. Next, he visits the Farragut. Nakia knew the risks when she signed up for Starfleet. She doesn't blame him. She doesn't forgive him because she says there's nothing to forgive. No more guilt, Jim. Back on Amarend, Kirk says his farewell to his wife, Miramini. He says that she and their baby were gifts he could never repay. And she says something interesting. One does not repay a gift. And that's true. That's what makes it a gift. The Great Spirit calls us to forgiveness of others and ourselves. It's a hard moment of all the women Kirk has loved 
Maramini was the longest and most committed relationship. They were married. They conceived a child together. We always remember Edith Keeler and Carol Marcus, but we forget Maramini. We shouldn't do that. Raina is last, and she doesn't look impressed. This might be the hardest one of all. But then, her face softens into a smile. There are no words exchanged. It seems none are necessary. It's a good performance from both of the actors. It's done. Kirk has experienced closure with all of them. But he still doesn't remember the password, and Calsus only has six minutes. Spock recommends withdrawal. When you have failed, there is nothing left to do but try to survive. But Kirk has another idea. Put the Enterprise in the path of the missiles with full shields. Spock surprisingly says they might be able to survive that, but they can't block all the missiles. But it's all they've got. This is the Starfleet way. You put your life on the line to protect others. Kirk is still seeing the little girl. Perhaps that's why his memory hasn't returned. He chases her through the ship. She offers him a gift, the same patterned stitching on the Native American headbands from Amerind. Realisation dawns on him. This is his unborn daughter. She has no name because he never gave her one. And at this point in the episode, my heart is just shattering. Kirk apologises to her that she never had a chance. He promises to love and remember her all the days of his life. As a father, this is a very emotional moment for me to watch. I can well believe that Kirk will think of her every day for the rest of his life. Of course, we'll never see that because this story was written long after the TOS movies that follow it chronologically. But it would be nice to see some sign that he continues to think about her in future episodes of Star Trek Continues. As she fades away, she whispers something in Kirk's ear. Evidently, this final closure allowed Kirk to remember the code. Kirk's log entry makes that sufficiently clear. The episode doesn't need to spend any more time on it. After seeing the technological might of the Federation, the Eretians have requested formal peace negotiations. That's a good outcome. We come to understand later that Iris's, the word that Kirk's daughter whispered in his ear, was the password. Kirk is now sold on the need for a ship's counsellor. He has approved a dedicated office for McKenna. I guess she used her quarters beforehand. You need privacy for her kind of work. It turns out the password was likely inspired by the painting by Vincent van Gogh. It is said he only painted one of the irises white because he was lonely. Just like Kirk. If that's what he chose for his password, it shows just how lonely he really does feel. The episode closes with McCoy suggesting that the part of Kirk's heart that wouldn't give up belongs to another lady. The obvious meaning to this would be the Enterprise. She has always been Kirk's lady. But I couldn't help but think about Carol Marcus, the other great love of Kirk's life who wasn't mentioned in this episode, probably because he hasn't met her yet. In fact, another fan series, Star Trek New Voyages, did an episode that told the story of Kirk and Marcus's first meeting. I'm kind of tempted to add that episode into the mix as we're going through Star Trek Continues. I can't believe I didn't remember this episode, though it started to come back as I watched it. This is a beautiful character piece. It helps to solve one of the big problems of TOS, lack of continuity. The episode provides consequences and continuation to some important emotional beats for Kirk in previous episodes. And much like how Avengers Endgame made some of the weaker Marvel movies more meaningful in retrospect, this episode adds power to those previous Star Trek episodes. So I think this is a triumph. Star Trek Continues actually reminds me a lot of Enterprise Season 4. It seems to be doing a similar thing. Next time, we'll be travelling through time with another episode that I don't remember much about. 
divided we stand. In the meantime, have a great two weeks, live long and prosper, make it so.